Welcome, everyone. Um, this is session four. Four, yes. Um, we're going to hop into session four today. So we'd like to do a, a brief recap of last week um, and kind of the things that we've gone over last week. Last week was um, batteries. We went over what amp hours are, what watt hours are. Hello? Okay. What amp hours are, what watt hours are. Um, we went over a couple of calculations, some simple formulas, um, kind of an overview on how to calculate your energy needs. We talked to briefly about um, batteries, um, different types of technologies on batteries, uh, the shortcomings of each technology um, that's out there that's um, the three major batteries that most people use. Um, we've talked about some social political issues um, in the new green type of uh, batteries that that they're they're pushing. So what else did we get into? We had a question. We had some homework. Uh, I think the question was, what is your community's minimum and maximum battery? capacity requirements. Um, I saw a couple of people did uh, and gave some feedback on the Canada's platform regarding what their community's um, capacities were or their individual capacities were. Uh, did anyone want to share what they worked out or their uh, methodology or what they were thinking? Sure, I'll go ahead, man. Um, what I'm thinking about, uh, good evening, and thank you all for being here, and thank you for hosting this. This is very valuable, especially in regard to what's happening around the country, and in particular, what's on the news in Hawaii, on the island of Maui. Um, Getting engagement with individuals that are part of your community and finding a way to define community will enable you to create agreement on what is necessary to use on a daily basis. So in case of emergency, in case of a catastrophe, I looked at what is just essential and in my thinking, it's being able to communicate and then it's able to sustain life. So in military language, you have command and control. And those are things like phones, laptops, um, and then quality of life. So if you have refrigeration, especially in the situation where someone has medications, maybe not even as critical as formula for a baby because you know perhaps the, the, a person can breastfeed but um making sure that you can actually do what happens in emergency which is give aid to someone who's on the ground and then before you do that tell someone go and get help so for me being able to keep my essential items charged is critical. So I'm not gonna be drinking coffee. If I need something that's cold, I'll get ice cubes from the refrigerator and I'll stand in front of the ice box, but I'm going to really be very specific and we will get alignment and conversation about this. That's hopefully what we will have when we talk with people who, who, who are committed to being part of this community of people who will rely on one another, not only just in this instance of an emergency or a disaster, but hopefully they'll become more reliant in general because they'll have come to agreement. So I looked yeah. at a real bare bones approach and, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to be, um, and I only want to say that to folks so that they understand it's not that they're, what, what is important to them isn't important to me, but what's important for us, you know, how are we going to take care of each other in this situation? Um, 
So, that's so a really good point you bring up, and that's um, that community discussion that we were having in the first few sessions is really defining that community, coming to that alignment of what's important to everyone in the community, and then, uh, like you're saying, the triage and and evaluating what are your necessities and what what's not a necessity for moving forward. I see some <laughs> questions, so I wanted to try to open it up for Martha to ask the question. Well, um, in relation to what you were asking initially, for myself, being um, that I actually just went through this with the floods in California, um, we were affected by the, the rains in Planada, California, and I live in Merced, which is only about five miles out. And even in my community, where it's considered a uh, you know, a city, it's still a small community. Um, we were without power for four days and had it not been for my neighbors that had a generator and we all plugged in our refrigerators, that's all we were grateful for. I had hot water because of my water heater, but my next door neighbor, she had some type of water heater that uses electricity that, you know, anytime she wants hot water, it's like always hot and she doesn't have to wait for it to warm up. But in this situation, she realized really quickly that that it was useless because there was no electricity to man her uh, or operate her uh, water heater. So she was without hot water and we had hot water. So we kind of shared and shared resources um, and everyone's refrigerator on our block was still on because of this one neighbor. And that is really why I kind of looked at this situation um, as like, oh my gosh, I got to jump on it. And, and I've talked to other people since I've been in these sessions and they were like clamoring to ask me, when are you gonna bring it to Merced? When are you gonna bring it to our community? How can we get this? How can we um, be able to learn how to bring that? You know, and, and what is your idea of what you think we should do? And, and I'm like, well, I don't think it's any one person that could have the idea of how and what, because each community is different. You know, each community has their own needs. But for myself, I think that I look at more of the disenfranchised folks that have language barriers that are living on the red line side of town that don't have money to, to be able to go get a generator, don't have the resources to, to really hook up or understand how this can work. And look at the smaller groups that would benefit and, and offer these orgs like an opportunity to, to partake so they, they can have a generator amongst their community and use it for their given population. And I, and I look at it like if we could have several groups on that side of town to have um, a battery pack, then I, I feel like I've done a great thing for our community because those people will have something in case something happens. And then there are other folks as well that, you know, because we don't go by just by the, uh, the other side of the tracks, because on, on each, even in the affluent side of town, there's also some areas that, that are not as affluent, um, but are living in disparity. And how to you know connect with those different groups so that they can also be part of this. So as we're, as I'm learning, I'm trying to like create opportunity for other folks to start wanting to sign up for a possible workshop to give them the information. So I'm, I'm like, we're desperate for this information. And I just thank you because um, we have to be proactive versus reactive. And I don't wanna be in that situation again without some kind of backup or for my community members to have a backup. Thank you for uh, from raising that as well. Yeah, we definitely have to be proactive instead of reactive. I think a lot of people find out once they've gone through a disaster, um, I think one of the key takeaways that everyone can kind of pre-plan for is the fact that um, there is no savior. I think sometimes people get caught in this situation where, oh shit, power's out. Oh, excuse me. Oh shoot, power's out. Or, oh shoot, there's an earthquake. And individuals have a reluctancy to take action. They sit and wait for orders. They sit and wait for news broadcasts and so forth, which is great if they're, they're sharing something that's important, like don't head east. A major fire has broken out east. But as far as the resources that you and your family and your larger community will need, those are things that need to be planned out by the individuals, um, by that community. So the individuals and the, the communities that are prepared that are not waiting are the ones that everyone's going to start leaning on. 
So also keep that in mind. So, and that's a very good observation as far as looking at your surrounding communities and saying that there may be a gap or maybe a need uh, in this community or in that community. Um, one of the things I will stress is uh, it's, it's kind of a, a, the fields that have thorns in them, thorn field, blackberry field, um, kind of like if you're trying to navigate speaking for other community um, and saying or assessing other communities and like, oh, this community needs this, this community needs that. Um, kind of a, a gentler approach sometimes is to invite yourself into that community or be invited into that community. And then once you're part of the community to start running assessments. Um, mm -hmm. Outside people assessing what a community may need often um, miss the target um, because we, we have a tendency to champion what's inside of our own hearts versus what may be in the needs or the heart of that community. Um, yeah, in this situation, I was kind of blessed because I'm on the Planada in Action Board and, and I was at Command Post when it happened. Uh, as soon as I could leave my home, we were flooded and we couldn't get out we were down there working with the families and they were wiped out their homes were completely wiped out and even if we had a generator it wouldn't have made a world of difference because the houses were completely flooded but for the homes that weren't completely flooded that would have helped at least have a couple of homes that would have been able to keep food cold and and work as like a outside uh conduit for more more food sustainability, because that was really where the crisis was. There was no way of keeping food uh, cold or even, like you said, medications safe. Thank you for that again. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to Rome to see if, um, if there's any highlights from the Canvas forum that should be brought up. Yeah, um, so hey everyone. I wish that I could have my camera on and make direct contact with every single person on there, but we've been having storms out here in Ohio. So my internet is a little funky. So just imagine me smiling really, really big and talk with my hands sometimes. So you, you could just put that image in your mind, um, but you have me there, all right? So what we wanna do is really start to think about um, what we've been talking about on Canvas. And I think our last two discussion forums have been really centered about community, right? Um, we're thinking with community in session two. Um, in session three, we're understanding batteries. And in this session, infrastructure and logistics, you'll be diving in a little bit deeper in how to build up um, your collective. In session five, you'll go into that a little bit more as well. So I wanna know if anyone wants to share these are two questions. You can choose any question you want to share with anyone, um, whichever one resonates with you the most. And I'll drop it in the chat as soon as I say it. So how do you determine what an emergency is in your community? How do you determine what an emergency is in your community? Another one is what is essential for your community. This can go into what is, what is essential for your community to survive um, different uh, accesses or inaccesses to energy and power. This can go into, um, I know some folks, uh, I think this was Kelvin who mentioned like three essential things for their community, which is communication, sustained life and quality of life, right? So that may be something that you list as essential for your community and communication or loss of communication may be something that you may say, that is what I qualify as an emergency. If you're someone who's thinking more about appliances, right? You may think, the first, these are the first appliances that come to mind to be very essential for my community survival. These are things that we instantly need. So if anyone wants to share, drop in. How do you determine what is, what is an emergency in your community? All right? Or you can even answer that and say, this is what an emergency looks like for us. Oh, I see hands, I see hands. Baritha, would you wanna start? You can start us off, share. Um, yes, what an emergency um, sounds like to me is when I don't have what I need to be prepared for the emergency. If, uh, if, uh, if a storm comes and I have everything I need and I know I'm gonna be okay and I'm not fretting for anything, 
Um, it's less it's less of an emergency for me. Um, it's when I'm caught off guard and I don't have the things I need and I'm, you know, freaking out. That's when it's more of an emergency. Mm. So preparation or not feeling prepared. Eugene, I think I see you with the hand. Yes. Uh, uh, as far as when an emergency might be happening, as in a power outage, I notice traffic lights are out in a given area. If I'm driving around, I see several blocks of no traffic lights working. I, I start to uh, think, okay, these people are without electricity. And then one can go to the grid provider. In our case in Ohio, it's American Electric Power. Go to their website and they'll have a map of the Columbus area and it'll, it'll, be, it'll show the communities or the parts of the city that are without power. Um, so that's when and where um, part of the question. So we're getting landscape, like what we witnessed. We're also taking inventory of preparation, whether or not I'm prepared, whether or not I feel prepared, right? Anybody else? I see we're having comments in the chat. Um, if anyone would like to share out, we'll take one more. How do you qualify an emergency in your community? Well, to save some time, I'll read some from the chat if you all are comfortable. Um, I think someone said, is a significant portion of a population at risk event where backup systems are needing to be activated to sustain the quality of life uh, for at-risk people. So we're getting that quality of life um, as a kind of constant thing, right? Threats to health, life, and safety. Um, an emergency is an event that diminishes my quality of life in order to grace my ability to sustain myself and loved ones, including pets or many folks, um, community-wide threats I'm hearing. Oh, I have a hand, and would you like to share as our last, our last share for the day? Yes, we love, um, my name's Ann Meredith, I rock with she, her, and her, I'm from New Orleans, um, this is a little baby Nawa. Um, I'm thinking about two, y'all yeah, were talking about communication, and so thinking about how we're coming into hurricane, I mean, we're in hurricane season, but we're coming into the height of hurricane season. And so thinking about both um, communication and being able to name amongst ourselves in real time, because we have like a mutual aid round table, um, like a folks council of different mutual aid collectives all around town. And we come together before, during and after storm season to support each other and, you know, building at the speed of trust, deepening relationships, doing skill shares, you know, knowing who's, who's got which resources at which hubs, including solar generators, right? Who has which, um, like doing a strengths-based community uh, needs, mapping all of that goodness, who is multilingual, which spaces are wheelchair accessible, right? So like, if you have a solar generator, that's fantastic, but is it upstairs? Is does it have like a police station right across the street? Is there, you know, like, um, are there gender affirming restrooms? Do the like folk inside speak um, all of the different languages of within our community? Um, so how we can deepen those skill sets ahead of time, and then thinking about communication in real time. We've been like building mesh networks so that we can build our own internet communications when everything's down. Because last time, cell phone towers fell into the water, right? So we can't. We don't have access to internet. We don't have access to cell phones. Um, but then also how to get how to communicate amongst ourselves in real time, but also how to communicate with the outside, because they send in police, they send in national guard with AKs, they send in ICE. Right? So also how to communicate with folks from away, needs, boundaries, um, just all of that. So communication with needs before, during, after, real time amongst ourselves. And also we have well-intentioned folks thinking they know what their, our needs are and sending us all kinds of goodness that um, can either cause harm or uh, just be another thing to have to deal with. So anyway. Sending y'all love from Sweet Rascal Babes. Thank you for that, Anne. 
Um, with that, I think we're going to transition to a lot of the things that you were bringing up there um, are actually exactly what we're about to get into and dive into today for our agenda. Um, so with that, a uh, couple of things. One, before I pass it to you, Crystal, um, when we're thinking and when we're imagining like how we would like to respond to emergencies, um, I would invite people to, to try to start thinking about independent solutions. So solutions that aren't reliant on other things. Um, there was a, a, a note going around in the, the chat regarding like refrigeration or how can we refrigerate our medicine? You want something that's um, disconnected, something that's standalone, something that doesn't rely on something else. A refrigerator relies on uh, electricity. So if you can find a solution that's not a refrigerator that doesn't rely on something else, then that could be a possible solution. So that same, um, same theory can be applied to a lot of different things. And you'll see kind of how that works when we start talking about logistics, logistics as well. So um, independent and also redundant. Yeah, redundant is, is definitely something that also helps. Um, so I will pass it to Crystal. We'll get into today's topic. And with that on logistics, today, this week, is we are talking about infrastructure and logistics. So our objective for today, I guess we have 25 or, or about 40 minutes left to understand infrastructure and logistics within the battery collective context. Um, a lot of folks have shared a lot about sharing resources for communities to have backup, how to be proactive, not reactive. I think it's really, really important to think about how we create that connective tissue between our community throughout the year, all the time. So we're not just reacting when the when the when the emergency comes. I want to highlight in chat, Eliza in Ohio said, less concerned with prioritizing emergency and much more concerned with getting my fellow community members used to systems that we can use from just for fun to basic normal to drastic outages. So how can we do that? Um, we'll share from our experience at the Battery Collective in the Bay Area of California and hope that what we're sharing will be helpful for your learning and your planning for your community. One thing I really, really want to just remind all of us because we're thinking a lot about emergency preparedness, we also want to think about what real solution we can create because the fact is emergency breeds desperation and desperation breeds false solution. So we're not here to build breed false, false solutions here. We're here to try to figure out how we can build that, that connective tissue within our community so we can actually start to practice the community power that we have been talking about and create this alternative solution, alternative way out of the extraction that we've been seeing. So the way we're gonna do this is we're going to do some storytelling and imagine we're sitting around in a circle around a bonfire. And so it'll be really, really helpful if we can turn on the camera, you can be eating with us, and so we're just going to be sharing stories together and we'll pause to, say, to, to um, see if you have any questions. We're gonna share different five stages of stories is how we're gonna be spending our time. So if you, if you don't mind turning your camera on, that would be really, really helpful for all of us to just feel the sense of community as we share stories, share learning from how we do it at the Battery Collective. And while, as we're slowly turning our camera, I'll just ground ourselves just back in session two, we did a little simulation exercise where we wanted to just kind of imagine there has just been a some sort of disaster that um, after touching, after getting in touch with your community, you realize that there are two groups without power and in need of batteries, and you just happen to have a community shared battery. We put you in small breakout rooms to kind of talk with your community that you're sharing batteries with to figure out how to deliver the battery. We came up with different ideas on um, brainstorming for pathways to get there. And for today, we're going to share with you how we do it at the Battery Collective. And But then we're not going to share with you like the final answer because this is an emerging process. We're always learning. And so we're going to share with you different things that we've tried. One way um, just so to share how we've done it, I will start by saying that it's important to look at the logistics in two ways. One, of course, within the prompt is how do we get the batteries to the two groups of people who need power? And so 
for us, we learned that having an active network of people communicating with each other really makes it very easy to mobilize the muscles to move the battery. You can find the battery, find the movement, uh, the mover to move the battery and coordinate timing and things like that a lot easier. So having that connected tissue was really important for us. And then of course, how do they even find us when people have their power out? How do they find us? We realized that a second lesson that we learned is focus on putting your words out to the community instead of getting into the deep ends of the theoretical things and, and decision-making process and stuff like that, that for us, we kind of fell into. So with that said, um, I'm seeing more faces. Thank you all so much. Hi, friends. Um, we're going to jump into a little storytelling time between Kansas and I. We're just going to share different stages of how what we tried in a somewhat chronological order. And then we'll pause after each of the stages and then see if you have any questions or thoughts and comments or observation, and then we'll go on to the next stage. How does that sound? Okay, great, I'm seeing hand nods, thank you. So I'll start once upon a time, that was in September, 2020. It was September 18th and September 23rd, right after the big orange day in the Northern California area where the Oregon fire has caused a lot of wildfire smoke all the way up in the top level of the atmosphere. Our air was not as bad where we can still see pretty far out, but the sky was not orange, kind of red. And it felt like we're on Mars. And so that was also still, we're still six months into the COVID period. People are still isolated. We're still in lockdown and people are still trying to figure out how we can help each other out. The idea for an emergency community backup power supply came about. And so we kind of just, because people powered and, and a few of our members have been actively thinking about how can we create real solutions, we just we thought maybe we should just put a call out to the community and say, if anyone's interested in try to work on back, community backup power supply, and we put out a community call on September 18 and 23 and September 23rd to um, try to see what stick and who wants to be part of it. About 50 people showed up. And for us, we learned that we don't want to get people excited and there's nothing. So within our members, we were able to put together three prototype batteries that was just built out by a couple members, which then allowed us to have a clear starting point. And it's important for us to start with something that you can feel in your hands or point to. So then that was like a really good starting point for us to get started with the vision of trying to create a, a connective tissue muscle for us to actually be ready to help each other out. Now, at this point, power shutoff was not happening as regularly as it was in 2019 and 2018. But we thought, man, this orange day and the wildfire, it's, pro it's very likely it's going to happen. So let's get prepared. So what we tried was we decided, man, well, it's probably going to be widespread, widespread power shut off. So we wanted to design something that addressed the immediate energy needs of others that would really that we can collectively control using these practices. And we came a lot of back and forth ideas and trials and tribulation, but a lot of the time they're also very inspirational and powerful. One thing I want to highlight, and I want to share with you our experience so that you can be prepared too when you have these conversations with your community, is that people were very, very thoughtful. When we're really thinking at this call, we're thinking like, this is a solution, this is an idea, what do you think? And let's like break into logistics team, governance team, technical team. People were really, really obsessed with this idea of designing an app. I mean, mind you, we're also in the Silicon Valley area, so there's a lot of app people designing an app with GPS on the batteries that you can like use your phone and locate it, kind of like Uber, you can find out where your Uber is, or kind of like these scooters that you see littered all around your, your city, that you can find out where they are, how much batteries left. People came up with these ideas like, oh, we want to like try to do something like that. People were concerned about internet because of power outage. So people were like, oh, maybe we shouldn't use internet, rely on Wi-Fi. So we should really be using texting or something that people were thinking about. And then they were concerned about cell towers coming down and need to consider ham radios. 
So these are a lot of these thinking and hypothetical things that people are really, really thinking about. And we ended up spending a lot of time talking about ham radios. We ended up spending a lot of time talking about surge. We spent a lot of time talking about disaster preparedness and we were not able to focus on the battery collective. So a key takeaway for, from that experience from us is really like, let's just focus on the battery so that we actually get something going. We can get these prototype battery moving. Um, for us, it's really important to really understand that we need to start trying rather, rather than debating for a better solution. Like we went from app idea to, oh, app is not gonna work because it relies on Wi-Fi. We're gonna do texting. Oh, texting's gonna work because cell phone's gonna come down and went to ham radio, we literally just keep going in circles and weren't really getting anywhere. And um, there were also conversations about like things that we can do. So questions around like, is this a logistical want or is this a logistical needs? People were trying to like, we're, we're kind of confusing these things a lot. And we ended up letting the battery just sit there and do nothing. And so it was, we did not really have the time to go out and talk to communities about this idea because we're all trying to figure out how to get the logistics, all the back end blueprint ready. And um, we had to, and one big thing that I really want to encourage you all because this is emergency, um, it's really easy to get into emergency preparedness conversation. And if you want to have an emergency preparedness conversation, please do. These are important conversations. But if you want to have a battery collective set up, make sure you focus your conversation with the community on battery collective. Because if you let the emergency preparedness conversation steep in, it's going to be a completely different conversation, which is an important conversation. That was one big lesson that we learned in the first several months of us coming together. Um, I'll pause here and see if there are any questions, thoughts, observations, before I like, pass it over to Kansas, the next chapter. Yes, Steph. In Michigan. So yeah, I I definitely hear and and I'm thankful that you um, shared that and mentioned how conversations go uh, in a different direction than what you initially wanted. So my question is. Like, could you have like just created the battery, like have the, the agenda, you know, we're going to do the battery. And, and it seemed like you did that up front so you met that uh, um, objective. And then, you know, when the conversation is about how to spread the word, like in Detroit, we'll like simply put a sign on a, on a wall in a, you know, in a gas station or a telephone pole, you know, this is the address, show up if you have a, a need. Um, we're, we're real low tech in Detroit. We're not Silicon Valley, you know, a lot of people barely know how to use a cell phone. So, um, you know, I, I just put that forward because that was the first thing I thought was, you know, I would have shut that down real quick and said, let's just put up a sign and see who, who shows up and what they need and um, kind of planned out having the other conversation after the emergency was over. Yeah, so true. So true. For us, because we're a lot of speculation, because you don't know when the next disaster is going to come. And we had series of wildfire, power shut off. And then it was right after the orange day. So people were ready for the end of the world to happen. People were ready for fire to burn down the entire East Bay area. Like people were, I'm not exaggerating. People were ready for that. So we were thinking like, man, we only have three batteries. We're not going to re be ready for everyone. So maybe we need to get all of these perfect things set up. And we got stuck in the cycle and we, the battery just sits there. And then what ended up happening was, I mean, thankfully, there was no disaster for many months. And I'll pass it to Kansas to share what we ended up doing when there were no disasters. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, to get there. Sorry. That's, that's all right. I mean, it, it's all important. So, um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to add in is this is our experience, right? And again, our experiences were specifically with batteries. 
um, and our community and our, uh, as we talked about, our accessing our logistical needs and wants for our community and what that means. Um, so, but this also applies to, again, any, anything that you may be collectively trying to um, share in the commons. Um, so the next thing that kind of on our journey that kind of progressed was a lot of talk and discussion also about exploring where the storage and transportation of the batteries would take place and how that would work, right? So we just talked about a little bit about how we procured our batteries. Again, some members gave them to us. Your story may be very different, but procuring the batteries is kind of the first step of understanding your logistical system and infrastructure you will need, right? Because you know how much they weigh, you know how much they can potentially power, you know their dimensions, um, and et cetera. And by, for us, again, there was a lot of talk about how we, oh, there should be, um, you know, cars to move it. All of that talk is very important. But again, at the end of the day, a lot of it was through trial and error um, and fine tuning the approach based on just collective feedback and experience. Um, so, you know, uh, we focused on creating a transport and system that was, that really embodied distribution, community ownership, but safety and reliability as well. You know, we decided to store batteries at individual members' houses to support the distribution, uh, obviously considering accessibility and pro proximity to potential power out areas. Again, these things are people, especially initially, we were just guessing, right? We we, we just had one experience and um, pe and people had a whole bunch of ideas, but at the end of the day, we didn't really have any hard um, facts or t test cases, right? Um, that helped us prove out how to efficiently do that or what was best for our community. So again, I you're going to be hearing this a lot, but it really, you, we're going to em emphasize like trying out and experimenting just to see what happens. Um, but I, additionally, we also aim to uh, uh, store the battery securely, right? We wanted security and storage to be, was also talked about in a concern. Uh, because we wanted to make sure that it was accessible, not just maybe directly to members, but maybe to friends of, you know, members, right? So they know their friend has having experiencing a power outage, right? How would that look and how do things like that play into the storage and even the transportation of, of the batteries or whatever you're maintaining? Um, so some just key takeaways, right? You're based on what you're trying to store your, and your community, you're going to have different needs and requirements. The way that you move them um, are going to have different requirements, uh, weight, size, right? So in our cases, cars, we use cars mostly because they were big uh, egg crates that were pretty heavy, but that didn't stop people from thinking, again, this is why having the actual battery is important. You know, maybe we could build a cart for bikes and that is all possible. It just depends on what you're working with. So um, again, thinking about what your community's needs are and what re the reality of what your community has is super important. Um, and actually, I'll pass it back to you, Chris, or I guess we'll pause for questions. <laughs> we'll pause for any questions on this briefly and open it up the space for a second. And I'll, I'll share that one, uh, one example story from what Kansas was sharing was actually one of our battery collective members was in a meeting on some like co-housing meeting. And then one participant didn't have to have their camera off because their power just went out. So then she was like, oh, you should, we have a battery collective, you should use it. And so she texted one of us and one of us texted another person. And then we, another person like um, said, I am, I'm able to move the battery, but the person has the battery is not there. So then there was like a whole coordination that happened just through a, a bunch of text threads that happened, um, and I think that actually happened on Slack was what we used at one point, but we'll get to that soon. But the idea like that you could just know you have exactly where to move it and how close it is. We can like identify where the closest battery was and then who's actually available nearby and, and then to move it. It's obviously pretty small scale, but it's a good place for us to start. And yeah, again, the security is tied in there with accessibility. So making sure your security and needs and requirements are met as well, right? Because you may want 
um, people to have, like having a padlock accessible, right, with a code so any member could potentially come and access the battery is important in logistics because you never know who will be available. So considering the security, because you want it to be secure, but also considering the accessibility is a balancing act. Uh, I wanted to call that out. So Yeah, totally. And also I, I mentioned in the chat that the power shutoff data was not public and most of the power shutoff was really happening because of, they call it the uh, PSPS, like public safety power shutoff. We call it profiting shareholder profit power shutoff. It's really just a way for them to shut off some convenient substations to, to re reduce the risk of fire. And they did not have that information public at all. So when we decided to move the battery to areas that needed power, and then we just let it sit there. So when the power comes on, they become the charging charger that, that we call the babysitter of the batteries. Then we now have the batteries where shutoff tends to happen. So then we're literally moving where the, the investor owned utilities were shutting power off when we don't have the, the data. Whereas if we have a centralized place that holds it all the time, you cannot plan for where to go at all. So we're able to just let it move to wherever the shutoff was happening because it was just complete organic and they would just live wherever the people are holding the battery or using the battery lives. So with that, I'll move on to the next stage. Um, so as I mentioned, I kind of skipped the Kansas section, my apology. As I mentioned, after like we figure out the storage, storage and and the transportation and all this stuff, we were able to move the batteries a few times, but then there was no disaster at all, which is really great. But at the same time, we're all planning for a major disaster. And so it, it was like a huge mismatch and we didn't know what to do. And now all of our members just kind of sat there and waiting for terrible things to happen, which is not good. And how do we continue to engage with our members to feel like they're part of something we, we started to ponder how to prioritize our resources during non-emergency time. So for our solution, we created a testing brigade to understand battery logistics, operations and transportation, all the things that Kansas mentioned, like if you just have the battery locked up somewhere um, with a padlock, but nobody's using it, everyone can forget about it. So we need to keep moving it around and we created this testing brigade. So all of our members get to just sign up and move the battery as if you have power shut off. So then now when you don't have shut off, you can pretend that there's a shut off and then think about what do I need? Okay, I need um, air filter because it's, it's, it's a smoke season. It's uh, I also need a fan because it's really hot. Like people start to think about these things a lot more when in reality, most of the time, when you ask people, what do you need a battery collective for? What do you need battery for? Most people's answer in my experience is I need a generator. Okay, well, if I give you a generator, what are you going to power? A uh, generator? That's generally people's answer. People just cannot think about energy because we just use energy so mindlessly. We don't know, like, when the power goes out, this is what we need until you have a battery at home and you pretend that there's no power and you can start plugging things in. And as Kansas mentioned in the podcast, like, he tried it out and realized, oh, no, I can't use a water heater. For the, for the battery, like it was a great experience for us to actually practice in our body to know, oh, when power shutoff happens, I shouldn't be drinking coffee. I think we just shared this earlier. Like what, so these things that we get to try out when there's non-emergency. Um, so there, we came up with this idea mostly just from just hanging out, laughing and practicing democracy, imagining things and sharing what we learned together, it was really wonderful. So for us, a big key takeaway in that chapter was we want to lean into trust that we have with the group. And really, um, yeah, one big thing was there was a huge advocacy, advocacy uh, voice in that group was like, no, we cannot, we have to prioritize the batteries for medical use only and for people who have serious needs. And we focus so much on these prioritization because we're getting ready for a massive disaster, but when we, in reality there was none, we kind of just got stuck and then we couldn't use it for events that we can activate people to look at the batteries. So we found decided, you know what, we should bring, the, bring it out as a testing brigade. We should bring it out to outdoor events so people can start to look at the battery and think about it more. So a big key takeaway, key takeaway for us was really 
trying not to get bogged down by the obsession with setting up guardrails that some bad actor is going to take advantage of the batteries. Um, that's something that we experienced was people just really wanted to make sure nobody's going to take advantage of it. Nobody's going to prioritize it for catching up on their TV show when somebody needs it for breathing machine. Like we're really hypothetically like thinking about how do we make sure this doesn't happen? And it really feels like a lot of trauma reaction. And what we learned to do was to lean into the trust we have for each other. And that's, it's easy to say, but it's, it's really hard to get done, but we have to lean in and just encourage the community to say, hey, understand there might be bad actor, but among all of us, can we just agree that we're gonna do this for the best of our community so we can start moving the battery, start testing it out so that we can actually get the stuff out as far as we can and truly leap into the faith into the faith for love and abundance for our community and not be worried that somebody's going to come in and take advantage of things for silly things. So we tried out testing brigade and putting it out on events. I'll pause here for, this is a third section of our experience and see if there's any questions, comments. And I also realized, my goodness, we're almost at time. Mm -hmm. If there's no burning question, we'll move on to the next section. Yeah, I, I think we can, the last section, we can just kind of wrap into this one. Um, and this one is just um, talking about kind of membership and safety. Um, so as as we started to get out of the test brigade and, you know, disasters actually started to happen, we started to have people wanting to do events. Um, learning from those experiences, we recognized we should have some educational basics around the safety and use and maintenance of the batteries, as well as a membership process. Uh, like form and um, yeah, form basically, yeah. flow process. Uh, we introduced, uh, so yeah, we so we basically came up with, um, as you guys experienced last week, kind of the introduction to how to care and maintain for the battery. Uh, this is important, we felt, so that people didn't either hurt themselves or damage uh, the batteries. So we found that that was important. Additionally, there was a lot of discussion around how who should have access to the batteries and how membership, what we, if you want to think of it that way, should work. Uh, for us, what we ended up doing is we kind of had two official forms for membership or use. One was kind of a terms of service, which reminded the person that they should uh, study the safety guidelines and educational material before using the battery. Uh, and then we also had what we've, we've referred to as a library card membership, where someone would sign uh, like a term agreement as a member saying that they uh, like are formally a, a member of the collective and would like to check out a battery, uh, if you will. That's the analogy we were using um, in the future or um, anything like that. Again, that's how we uh, broke down membership um, and understanding uh, kind of our learnings from how to take it from just an experimental group to a more diverse group where people have friends and friends and it's more spontaneous. But we also still, people still really wanted to understand uh, the boundaries of members versus non-members. Um, so key takeaways were really, at some point we did have to craft <clears throat> some crude or rough uh, membership agreements and safety guidelines. We'll actually, I think, I think those are will be provided as resources. So you have, um, see what we came up with. Again, these are just templates and for us, what we ended up using. Um, and yeah, I think we can probably pause there for thoughts. <laughs> it was quite a lot. In that process, after this whole storytelling section, we're going to have you experience it. Yes, um, very brief. So you, you, that would make a lot more sense. Eugene. Yeah, the, the safety issue is not just us as in the collective knowing about how to handle these batteries, but if we drop them off at somebody's house, obviously that person is not particularly uh, trained. So my thought, I just got this thought a minute ago, I have a spare car I don't really use for much. I've got 1500 pounds of extra batteries I don't use for my solar off-grid system and I could put them in the car and I've got extra inverters at uh, 4,000 watts of inverters drive up with four 100 foot extension cords and I could service four houses at once that's in, awesome 
in in the neighborhood and and just sit in my car maybe with a buddy so that the car would be safe and all that all that the person would have to deal with is an extension cord coming in their house yeah yeah that's that's an awesome idea thank you for sharing that I, I'm just going to wrap this section up and then we can move on to the, the next uh, exercise a little bit. Just one thing I always, I just want to bring home is this idea of is is logistics and transportation a strict business or is it actually more of a playful, fun thing, right? Like a lot of our indigenous ancestors that lived on this continent um, experimented with farming. It, they didn't just to start, figure out one day they could start sitting in one place and grow and everyone just decided let's just start growing cereal grains and maize right uh it that was it the agricultural revolution was actually three thousand years of playful understanding of what it could possibly mean to live in what it would mean to sit settle down and have agriculture or have seasonal gatherings throwing you know, seeds at flooding heads of rivers and things and seasonally coming back. So I think embracing the idea, because we always think that these things are very serious and they need to be hammered out perfectly to make the thing right. But reality is, is it takes time and iteration. And I think thinking of it as having fun and playing, like um, Eugene was just I, experiencing legitimate fun and thinking about how he could provide power to his community. And so we want to just make sure that that is at the core of all of this. All of these things are important, but at the end of the day, it's it's about us. So I just wanted to end end with that. Yeah, thanks for that. And maybe this would be a good time for us to kind of just transition into like experiencing the process that the People Power Battery Collective works, unless we have any burning questions. Seeing none. Great. I'm going to share my screen and I'll pass it over to Yasir, kind of walk us through the, the stages that, that um, Kansas kind of briefly shared as a learning that we had. And um, these are the steps that from what you just heard from Kansas and I, this is the, the steps that we, we walk through. So Yasir, why don't you walk us through? And pretend, imagine you are in this process that Yasir is walking you through in this journey. So this was an exercise that the People Power Co-op did. We're trying to imagine like a person coming in, what would the person or individual who is requesting the battery or would like the battery would need. And we kind of were envisioning going through the steps. Um, So, you know, step number one, we wanted the individual to understand and learn how to use the battery um, and to make sure it's a form where it's not like this form where it's like, hey, imagine that there's a battery, but actually have something that's tangible that they can see, feel, touch, and say, okay, great, this is how it works. Um, so we created the video. I think the video was shared in our last session, just showing people how to go through it um, and also making it readily available offline when it's not being used that individuals can come take poke poke at it and see what it can do and what it can't do um after that we were you know inviting people in to become members um so we decided that if if individuals are members then they'll be part of the collective uh, when they're part of the collective then they can be loaned a battery so we decided um that the easiest flow that w- we could imagine is something that's uh familiar to everyone. And that was uh, the library. So if you go to a library and you have a library card and you kind of check out a book. So kind of that same flow is is where you are here, where you remember you come and you you check out a battery essentially. Um, so after you, be- sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just drop in chat the membership agreement um, and I really encourage you to click on it and take a look at it. We can take a moment just kind of like have you browse through it, pretend that you just you were just at an event, heard yes your talk, and you saw the battery, and now you're filling out this membership form. So you can kind of just now put yourself into the situation of going through this process. And then when you're going through this process, you can kind of feel like, what didn't work for me? What I really like. So when you're designing one for yourself, for your community, you can identify what you want to take out. So 
Um, these forms are going to, we have created, thank big thanks to Shareable, we created um, editable form for you to actually kind of just copy these. So take a moment and look at this form and um, yeah, we can pause a little bit. I don't know, yesterday, what do you think? We can pause a little bit for folks to kind of read through the form. Yeah, I'll pause and just as you guys are looking through the form or clicking on the link to see the form, um, just to state this is a form that works for us. Every community is different again. So this is kind of a skeleton. You guys take it or leave it. But this is kind of what we have just for individuals to fill out. Some people may say, oh, in my community, we don't have phone numbers or we don't have emails, like whatever the case is, understand this is what was suitable for our, um, our community. So your form may look something like this. It may look completely different, but this is, um, yeah, our, our offering here. I see Stephanie. So an individual would fill out. Go ahead. I see Stephanie's hand. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yes, yeah, Stephanie. Thanks. Thank you for recognizing. So the burning question I have about all of this is, what do you do when the battery is not returned? I mean, if it's like a library. When there's a book, there's an actual charge uh, every day that you haven't returned the book. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, what do you do? Yeah, we uh, we hired this guy. His name is Frankie Fingers, and uh, we sent him to go collect when it's time to collect the battery. Uh, it's been working out great. <laughs> um, no, seriously. So, yeah, this conversation did come up. We talked about, you know, we thought about and we spent a good amount of time on thinking about um, a lot of pitfalls that would come up. Like somebody doesn't return the battery, they destroy the battery, they damage the battery. So instead of trying to um, have individuals um, be in a position where there was like a liability or take out insurance on it and so forth, what we decided to do was to educate people. We said, if we invite people in to become members and explain to them that this is a community resource and the value of a community resource that it's for everyone. You break it, you're not breaking it for yourself. Uh, you're breaking it for the entire community. Uh, we feel like the onus of, of shame is on an individual and that they do take responsibility and pride and in, in I'm borrowing the battery, inviting them in to become a member, which is why this is like our number two step here. Um, and we feel like that actually, it took care of that entire discussion. So. Um, if you're a part of something, you're invited in as a member of something, we feel like that's easier than trying to police the batteries on the back end. So we didn't want to get involved in, you know, how uh, how this box currently runs. So we're trying to definitely think about other ways and other avenues to address the same issue. So thank you for that question. That's uh, how we handled that. Sorry, your hands up again or same up? It's up again. I have okay. a follow up question. Yes. So, um, in an emergency, a person is going to want a battery like during the entire time of the emergency. There, so how are you managing that expectation that you only get the battery for a couple of hours and then you have to allow someone else to get to use it? Yeah, we don't um we don't stipulate that. <laughs> so um we're going to, I'll, see, I'll, I'll continue here, and uh, that might actually get addressed in, in, as we continue here. So um, yeah, as you can see, this flow chart here, after they go through and become a member, they go into the membership database, um, and they just kind of sit there like code storage. Um, so an outage occurs. In the event an outage, outage occurs, um, the individual or whoever the member is would contact one of the organizers and say, hey, I have, you know, the power got shut down on my block um, and I'm in need of a battery. So can we can we have a battery? We need a battery. So sorry, I was just catching up there. Um, and this is where we got into how we contact it. So we just do a phone tree. Uh, phone trees are pretty pretty straightforward. We've tried text, we've tried Google Forms, we tried uh, a bunch of different things, but just simply calling one person and that one person calling someone else, knowing where the batteries are, we're, we're very easy to, to contact. Um, planning like really big when you're not really big was a waste of time. So 
plan to your size. And then when it's time to expand, then you can, you know, troubleshoot those things at that time. But don't go, oh, how are we going to do if this happens and if this happens and if this happens, just just think right now we need to get this resource out. What's what do we have at our disposal right now? Great. We have phones right now. This is what we're going to use when we're trying to figure out uh, other communication uh, methods for for those outages and solutions will come up in in that regard later on. So after the person gets the battery, so we loan them the battery, um, the community loans them the battery, there's a user agreement that they, they complete. Uh, the user agreement goes over again how to use the battery for that safety aspect that we were initially talking about. So it's a, a re-review saying that you signed up before, you haven't had an emergency in six months, so now you need the battery. We'd like you to review the safety guidelines of the battery and complete the user agreement, which just says this is a community asset, essentially. Um, and I think we'll end up dropping in chat exactly what the user agreement looks like. Um, but yeah, this is a community asset. You're borrowing it from the community. Please take care of it. Here's the guidelines on how to take care of it, do's and don'ts, um, and then contact information if you run into a problem. So the user would then, there's also a video that they can go and take a look at um, that I think we shared with you guys. And again, it just goes over to how to use the battery, how the battery works. Um, the battery is then at that point, when they contact us, we arrange a time and a way to get the battery to them. So either they're gonna pick it up from a location X or location X is gonna figure out a transportation or a way to get it to the individual. And because we have three different batteries and there are three different sizes, they can support different things. So we also created a battery request form. Um, I'm also dropping in chat just so you can see like what kind of questions are basic questions that we found out that people can click through and say like, these are my needs. And so and then internally we can determine um, what, what, um, which battery, battery we want to send to folks. Thank you for that. Um, and then they take the battery and they use it to power their equipment. Um, hopefully by the time that their power outage or their emergency is over, their power will be back online. They'll call us and say, hey, thank you very much. Uh, you know, it helped me out and we'll arrange a time to retrieve the battery at that point. Um, we don't set a limitation. The limitation is basically uh, based off of the battery's capacity. And yes, Crystal? And in fact, we don't even encourage them to retrieve to retrieve the battery. We really encourage them to take care of the battery because when they're experiencing like blackouts, most likely their neighbors will be explaining, experiencing blackouts sometime soon again. So really encouraging the battery to then start moving towards those locations. But if they don't want to have this thing that belongs to somebody else in their house, they could, they could also arrange a way for us to pick up to move out of their house. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a really good point. So yeah, having it having the battery closer to where the battery is needed or potentially needed is uh, definitely a goal of ours. Yes, uh, Stephanie. Sorry, all these last minute questions. So my final, I think my final question is, how are you funding batteries that you know for others to be able to keep on site to address their emergency needs? Um, you know, I, I'm like, I, I know I could probably come up with enough money to make a couple to share, but, you know, it, it seems like it's something that you need to have a lot more capacity so that people can keep them on site at their home. So I'm, I'm just interested. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Frankie Fingers doesn't like us giving out his information, but um, <laughs> uh, we, we do within the battery collective um people donate and give resources in order to to make the batteries happen that have happened um you can source batteries there's a lot of different ways to do it on the skinny like where you're not spending a lot of money upfront money so you can source use batteries you can source use inverters um those are things you can do wiring you can source use wire as well um so there's ways that you can make batteries that are, are not that expensive so, so it's like neighbors donating their car battery, you know, they put this together for temporary use and then they put the battery back in the car. I like it. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, 
I mean, so a lot of times people, a lot of times, a lot, a lot of times people get rid of car batteries that are perfectly fine too, because they don't, they don't test them properly. But um, car batteries, um, there was discussion in the chat earlier about mobile batteries and battery stations. Like um, if there is like a catastrophic emergency, like the, the, the easiest way in our community to get batteries is we have these little electrical scooters that people drive around all the time. Um, those have EV batteries in them. The little uh, the EV bikes that people are on the side of the road, those all have EV batteries in them. Uh, and those are all like lithium, good quality batteries. Like so, and I'm sure they'll be sitting there because people aren't thinking, but they're so there. Wait, so so you're like commandeering someone else's private property to use the battery. No, I'm saying <laughs> in an emergency, in an emergency. But, uh, but but that goes back to the conversation of what's your definition of an emergency. Yep, and that's for everyone's community to define. So oh, like I said, wow. here, that's what we have here uh, as uh, resources. We have like an agreement with you know the company that you know during a three day blackout we're going to use your EV. It's it's the same agreement. Same agreement. I think the community at large would have with like a Walmart. You know, like if it's a catastrophic event and Walmart's there, the community's probably going to get the resources that they need from that Walmart. Um, so it's it's yeah, it's the Walmart inner community agreement. That's what we'll call it. Um, but I don't want to take up too much time because I think we're actually yeah. already over. So I will. Um, was there anything I missed on this, uh, Crystal? And yeah, please please feel free to post this stuff on Canvas too for more follow up. Yeah, yeah. sounds like a fun discussion. <laughs> but yeah, Kansas. Oh sure, let's wrap this up. Uh, okay, so just to summarize a couple things that again we've talked about, um, we learned that taking action is more powerful than endless debate. Uh, about transforming daunting obstacles into valuable lessons and learning experiences. Uh, we've recognized that striving for a perfect blueprint can be paralyzing, while focusing on realistic so solutions can drive progress and learning. Um, yeah, and we hope we've also talked a lot about different aspects of logistics itself, from procurement, transportation, security, maintenance, um, membership, uh, return policy, all of those things we address at least briefly, and those are the things that hopefully get you started in understanding how to understand how to view your logistics system in your specific community and what you can be looking out for. Yeah, so our key takeaway question or take, take home question for you to reflect on for the rest of the week is what are your logistical wants and what are your logistical needs? And just use an example of how to think about this question, what your logistical wants and logistical needs are for us, it became pretty clear that our imagination that this whole place might burn down, while it, it very, might, very much might well be, but thinking about ham radio, thinking about like potentially not having internet, a lot of these things and wanting to design an app, a lot of these things could potentially be logistical wants and not so much of logistical needs when people's power is just shut off and how are we actually getting our words out so people can actually get in touch with us so that we're not like cycling circling stuck in a spiral and circle of all these theoretical questions that gets us stuck because we cannot tell the difference between logistical wants and logistical needs it's really hard to decipher between these two things especially when, when we feel like emergency is so real because they are but at the same time we really just center what is it that our community needs today? What is it that we can do today to start practicing our muscle for sharing resources, start thinking about how we can engage in this conversation that, that our ancestors did, that, that created the situation that took hundreds of years to get us into agriculture. These conversations that get us going from one way of living to another is something that we need to start thinking about. And for us, we think, being able to decipher between logistical wants and logistical needs can really help you get there. So we hope you can think, think about these, this takeaway question and engage on Canvas for next week. Same time, same day. We will, on Tuesday, 
we will be talking about building collective culture and operations. So a little bit about governance. We're going to be exploring strategies for building an organic and sustainable collective culture within the Battery Collective, addressing governance and operational aspects. These are what we learned that work for us. Um, for the for our collective, that does not mean it works for everyone. So we hope this will be helpful for you. Um, so really excited to be sharing this with you next week. It will be our final kind of like a sit and listen, learn session. After the next session, we'll be doing office hours to really start working on these forms together. So it will be like a work session after the next week. So next week will be our final session where we'll be doing so much talking. And then in the following weeks, again, same time, same day on Tuesday, we will be doing more of like a workshop type work. So thank you all so much for the extra time you're giving us. And thank you all so much for being in the circle with us as we're sharing stories, hearing from you. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.